Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Can we thank God for that? Behold, I'm making all things new. As we think about just what's going to happen, God's going to make all things new. And he says, also he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Um, let us pray. Um, God, we just thank you so much for that powerful verse, God. As we take a moment to just reflect and to actually anticipate what is to come, God. We're just full of so much gratitude and full of thankfulness, God. Um, we thank you that as we go through our life, as we go through the ups and downs in life, as we go through the pain, sometimes we go through the setbacks, sometimes life throws punches our way, God, but we're reminded that we are in you. We are in your son. We are in your gospel. We are in your love, God. So even as we go through those tough moments in our lives, let us look forward to what's to come. Let us lean not into our own understanding, God, but let us lean into your truth, into your sovereignty, into your word, dear Lord God. We thank you so much for your love. We thank you for your reckless love that chases after us. Even when we mess up, your love still chases after us, and we are full of so much gratitude, God. As we look into this passage, speak to us. Let our hearts be open to what the Spirit has to say this morning. In Jesus' name, we give you glory, we give you honor, amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Vintage Church. If I've never met you before, my name is Pastor Dustin, and I serve as a pastor here. We are, believe it or not, how many of you have been on this 15-week apocalypse journey with us? We are finishing it today. And so if you've been journeying with us, how many of you are like, you know what, uh, I was really excited about this journey but this wasn't what I was expecting through this journey. Anybody kind of surprised at the book of Revelation a little bit? I think most of you, uh, if you've read the book of Revelation or saw someone talk about it late at night, uh, you've probably thought, man, there are some crazy things. I'll never be able to understand it. And hopefully what you've seen over these past 15 weeks is this reality. Number one, that the book of Revelation is for us. God has given it to us, and it's something that... Not only we should read and can read, but we can understand it. We can actually read it and take the truths and the realities of the book and apply them in our lives. And so this morning, we're wrapping up the book of Revelation. We're going to be in Revelation 21 through 22. If you don't have a Bible, uh, feel free to lift up your hand. Our Connect team would love to get you a copy of God's Word as our gift from us to you. Revelation 21 uh, and 22 will be there. And... I think one of the things that's important, because we can, you could read the, the, the end of Revelation kind of separate from the rest of the book, because we're going to read some really incredible truths and realities from the end of Revelation, but I want to remind you of all of the things that we've been covering over these past few weeks, all of the challenges and the realities that the, the early churches, the seven churches that the book of Revelation was written to, faced. That there was persecution, there was suffering, there was, for some of these Christians, death. And if, so if you look at that, there's not a whole lot of hope there, right? If that's the end, if it's suffering, pain, and death, how many of you say, sign me up for that? That's what I want to be a part of for the rest of my life. I mean, not many of us, right? And, and there's, this, there is this, there's this glimmer of hope throughout the book of Revelation of God judging evil and doing away with evil, but that's where Revelation 21 and 22 come into play. 
Because in, in the end of the book of Revelation, we see the promises of what God is going to bring, not just for the seven churches in the book of Revelation, but also for us, those of us who know and follow Jesus Christ. And so there's great hope when we read the end of Revelation, in Revelation 21 and 22. And the hope that we see is the hope of heaven. Now, how many of you have thought about heaven at some reality in, in, in life, at some point in your life? I mean, surely there's a few more of you. So here, here, here's the reality about heaven, right? The reality that we don't want to talk about, we don't want to think about, is we are mortal people. Mortal meaning each and every one of us, unless Jesus returns, will face and will experience death. And that's not, that's, again, that's not a reality that you and I want to talk about or think about, but that's reality. But as we think about death, we also begin to think about the reality of heaven. In our, in our resource center, we have this book by Randy Alcorn, simply called Heaven. And it is kind of the go-to resource if you're interested on, uh, to, uh, on in elements of heaven or understanding heaven more. And at the very beginning of the book, I want to read to you just a, a quick excerpt from this book because I think it speaks to the reality of heaven for all of us. This is what he writes in, uh, in this book. He says, The sense that we will live forever somewhere has shaped every civilization in human history. Australian Aborigines pictured heaven as a distant island beyond the western horizon. The early Finns thought it was an island in the faraway east. Mexicans, Peruvians, and the Polynesians believed that they went to the sun or the moon after death. Native Americans believed in the afterlife their spirits would hunt the spirits of buffalo. The Gilgamesh epic, an ancient Babylonian legend, refers to a resting place of heroes and hence at a tree of life. In the pyramids of Egypt, the embalmed bodies had maps placed beside them as guides to the future world. The Romans believed that the righteous would picnic in the Elysian fields while their horses grazed nearby. Seneca, the Roman philosopher, said, The day thou fearest as the last is the birthday of eternity. Although these depictions of the afterlife differ, the unifying testimony of the human heart throughout history is belief in life after death. Anthropological evidence suggests that every culture has a God-given, innate sense of the eternal, that this world is not all there is. And I think if you were honest with yourself and you were thinking about that question, anybody that you've ever interacted with before, you would, you would agree that that is a reality that each and every one of us in some form or capacity in life, are, we're going to think about heaven. We're going to think about death. We're going to think about the end. And rather than simply think about and, and, and ponder what we might think is in heaven or what heaven might be like, what I want you to see this morning is the reality that the book of Revelation paints regarding heaven. What The hope that we have to experience in the future. And so this morning, we're going to kind of be answering this question, what is heaven going to be like? What is heaven going to be like? And the, the first thing that I want you to see in regards to answering this question is that heaven is going to uh, be like this, creation's renewed existence. Creation's renewed existence. When we looked and we saw in Revelation 21, 1 through 5, what John just read for us, we see at the very beginning then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. There is a renewed creation in the end. We even see this isn't something new in the Bible. This isn't something that John just kind of concocted and say, hey, we've seen all of this bad stuff. Maybe it would be really cool if the world was all recreated. No, he's pulling back from uh, prophecies found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah speaks for God in Isaiah 65, 17. He says this, For behold, this is God speaking, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Isaiah 66, 22, For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name 
remain. These are promises hundreds of years before Jesus came that there was going to come a point in history when God would make all things new, when he would renew all things. When we read about, if you go a little later into the, in Revelation 21, particularly look at verse 9, you don't have to read it, go home and read it th- this week, but this, these are all images that you'll probably be familiar with. In our, in our popular culture, when we talk about going to heaven, kind of what's the first physical thing that we see? What gates? Pearly gates, right? We're going to walk on a street of, the sea will be like crystal. All of, the, all of the new heaven and the new earth is, uh, is kind of compared to different gems and diamonds and all of these things. And the point, yes, could they be literal? P- perhaps. Could they be symbolic? We're going to read in just a little bit. But the, the point is not whether they're literal or symbolic. Listen to this one commentator. This is what he writes about this. He says, God can, of course, create such precious stones literally. But even if he did so, it would probably be to make the same point as the symbolic interpretation prefers. What is rare and precious now will be abundant then. God's people will experience no lack and the future glory of the city for which we endure now is greater than the greatest splendor of the world's greatest institutions. You see, the the point of the new heaven and new earth, the point of what John is writing, the vision that he sees here is not for us just to say, hey, I can't wait to walk on a street made of gold or I can't wait to swim in that crystal sea or when I walk through those pearly gates or I get to be in that mansion or drive that car. That's not the point. The point is that we would literally be there in this new creation experiencing the way that God had originally intended from the very beginning, but sin destroyed. There's a renewed creation. There's a new heaven and new earth. The second thing that I want you to see related to the creation's renewed existence is not just that there's a new heaven and a new earth, but that you and I receive new bodies. Now, I'm pretty excited about this one because I've been trying to trim this gut for about a, a, a year now, and it's not coming off as fast as I wanted it to. The other thing, if you guys don't know about me, I'm a diabetic, and so I don't have a working pancreas, which is a really big pain for me. So I can't wait to get this new pancreas in heaven. I'm not going to have to take shots anymore. I'm going to eat every single carbohydrate that I can possibly get my hands on. I might, you know, for like a certain amount of eternity, I might just eat sweets, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That, that literally might be all I eat. New bodies in creation's renewed existence. This is what Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 40, 49. This is what Paul writes. He's comparing here the, the, our physical bodies, what we were born with, what you and I have right now, and what will come in the new creation. What will come in our resurrected bodies? This is what he says in verse 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. That's what we have right now. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, that's our literal Adam and Eve, our first father, became a living being. The last Adam, Paul's referring to Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. In God's renewed existence, in creation's renewed existence, we not only get to look forward to a new heaven and new earth, but new bodies. I don't know about you, but if God, had, if God had deemed that we were going to experience a new heaven and a new earth, why would we want to experience that in these bodies? 
These bodies that we know at some point in history are going to die. At some point in history are going to decay. I don't know about you, but if I get the opportunity to experience a new heaven and a new earth that does not fade away, that does not die, I want to experience it in a body that's going to do the same thing. I want to be able to experience that new heaven and new earth in the way that God intended it. And what's important for us to recognize, right? So when we talk about heaven, this is, this is really important because in our culture, in, all, in our day and age, I think we confuse this. When we talk about heaven, sometimes we're talking about two different things. So when we talk about heaven, the first reality is that when we talk about heaven, those who die and are in Christ, where do they go? Heaven, right? So there's that reality, and then there's the reality that we read in Revelation 21 and 22. And what I want you to see, this is what Paul is talking about in the book of Philippians when he says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When we die, our physical bodies die. If I was to, God forbid, drop dead right here, I mean, I would be right here, right? You would see my body, and it would be laying right here. And I'd pray that one of you would at least come and try and resuscitate me and bring me back, okay? But my physical body would be here. My spiritual body would not be here. In death, our spiritual body goes to be with the Lord. In heaven, heaven, a great way to understand heaven is wherever God is. Wherever the presence of God is. And so our spiritual bodies go to be with the Lord. Our physical bodies are in the ground when they're buried. What Revelation 21 through 22 is talking about is a different heaven. Where it's not just spiritual, but it's spiritual and physical together. The Bible talks about Jesus returning. He has experienced the resurrection, and one day he is coming back and bringing his kingdom with him. And when he does that, we will be resurrected as well. And our spiritual bodies, which is with the Lord, and our physical body will be resurrected, and those two will come back together. And the way we are to live our lives as physical beings is how we will live our lives for the rest of eternity. That's, that's an important reality, because let, think, think back to Genesis 1 and 2. When God created all things, he, when he, did he look at it and he say, hmm, I don't know if I did my best work there. I mean, did he say that? What did he say? It was very good. And so the, the, the thing that we struggle with is this ancient philosophy called Platonism that was from the Greek philosopher Plato. And what Plato said is that the physical is bad and the spiritual is good. So what we need to do is get rid of the physical so we can be spiritual. But that's not the worldview. That's not the reality of what the Bible is trying to paint. What the Bible says and what God wants you to know is that not just the spiritual, but the physical is good. And God created us to be physical beings worshiping and serving and living in a physical earth and reality. And so this new heaven and this new earth with a physical body is a real deal. And it's important because what God had intended, sin destroyed But what happens in the new heaven and the new earth is everything that God intended is remade. What's so incredibly important for you to recognize is this. Listen, we think Jesus is just enough. It's important and Jesus is just enough to save our souls. But what I want you to realize and understand is that Jesus didn't just save your soul. He saved all of you. Your spiritual and your physical. And it wasn't just enough that he would save your soul, but he came and lived and died and resurrected from the grave that he might remake and renew creation. That all of the world that was distorted with sin might be made new and made right. All of the evil and the suffering and the pain that we've been reading about in the book of Revelation, the point of Revelation 21 and 22 is that Jesus is coming to reverse all of that. And so the world in which you and I live right now is just kind of a glimpse and a picture of what is to come when all of creation is completely renewed. But here's the reality. The point is not just to be alive in a new creation. What is heaven going to be like? Yes, it will be a renewed existence. But number two, the second thing that we will experience is God's unhindered presence. 
There's a couple places in Revelation 21, 3, we, we read this. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Go to verse 22 and 23 in Revelation 21. And John writes this, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. And then go down just a little bit farther, Revelation 22, verses 3 through 4. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. You see, you've got to go back. To understand Revelation 21 and 22, you have to go back to Genesis 1 through 3. God created everything, just as we already said, very good. And part of that, part of being very good, part of that original creation being very good is that Adam and Eve, our first parents, were able to dwell in the presence of God. If you go and you look at Genesis 3, 8, after Adam and Eve have sinned and they're kind of hiding from the Lord, the text says the Lord God was walking in the garden in the cool of day. Now, what, what, is that, what does that mean? What does that look like? How was the presence of God present with Adam and Eve? We don't know 100%. But the reality of it is, is that the presence of God was there. And it was sin that broke that presence and distorted man's relationship with God. And, and, and all throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, what we are trying to do, what God is trying to do, is bring us back into right relationship with God, that you and I, that we might be able to dwell in the presence of God as he originally intended it all along. I mean, you think back, Genesis 1 and 2, they're, they're, they're in perfect relationship with God. They're dwelling in the presence of God. Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sin, and therefore they're thrown out of the, the garden. They're no longer to be able to be in the presence of God. And then when you look in the rest of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, Deuteronomy, into the Kings and the Chronicles and all of that, what you see is God telling the people of Israel to build a tabernacle. It's a traveling tent. And then that traveling tent, the presence of God would dwell in the midst of the people. And then God said, build a permanent temple. So they do that. And in both the tabernacle and in the temple, God's presence is dwelling. And the people are surrounding God's presence. But here's the reality. In both of those instances, in the tabernacle and the temple, there was only one person, one one day a year, who could go near God's presence. On the Day of Atonement, when when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies to atone for the sins of the people of Israel, that was the one day a year that the one person could go into the presence of God, but they still couldn't even look at God. When they walked into the Holy of Holies, it was smoke and incense that they had put up because if the high priest was to look at God, he would die. I don't know if you remember in, in, in the, the first five books of the Bible when Moses asks God, to st- he, Moses wants to see God. God won't let Moses look at him face to face. He says, hide yourself in the cleft of a rock and I'll pass by you and you'll see just the back of me. So all of this time, we're, we're looking and we're seeking because we recognize the way in which you and I were created. We were created not to be separate from, not to be um, apart from the presence of God. What you and I were created to, what we were created for is to be with God. Enter Jesus. In John 1, we see this incredible reality, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And and later on in John 1, it talks about the Word dwelling in our midst. Literally, that word word dwell is the, the Greek word that means literally tabernacle. That Jesus is just like the tabernacle of the Old Testament, camped out in the middle of the people. Right before Jesus dies, he tells, his, he tells his apostles that I'm leaving the earth. They're all like, you can't leave the earth. And Jesus says, listen, it's better for me to leave. So when I leave, the helper, the Holy Spirit will come and the presence of God will literally dwell within your hearts. 
And then we come to Revelation 21 and 22 where we see the hope of God dwelling in our midst. Not in a temple, not in the presence of the Spirit, but literally where we can see God face to face. This is what Randy Alcorn says in his book, Kevin, about this. He says, to look into God's eyes will be to see what we've always longed to see. The person who made us for his own good pleasure. Seeing God will be like seeing everything else for the first time. Why? Because not only will we see God, he will be the lens through which we see everything else. People, ourselves, and the events of life. I don't know about you, but when I go and I do things that I, I want to do, like exp, you know, the bucket list stuff that you want to experience, I don't, I don't like to experience those things alone. right? You want to share that experience. The one time that I went to Israel, all, the whole time during the trip, I'm like, man, this is so awesome. And then I would think, my wife wasn't with me. I, was like, oh, I wish she was here. I wish I could experience, because I'm not going to be able to tell her what this is like. My words are going to fall short. And that's the reality of the presence of God. Listen, life was not meant to be lived absent from the presence of God. Life was meant to be lived in the presence of God. And so when we come to this place and we see in the end the new heaven and the new earth, we recognize that, that heaven is going to include God's unhindered presence. What will heaven be like? I also want you to see this, not just this this renewed creation, not just God's unhindered presence, but finally this, Christ's victorious church. In Revelation 21, verses 6 through 7, this is what John writes. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end to the thirsty. I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. We're going to come back to verse 7, but just, just hold on to that, this verse. The one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God, and he will be my son. Look at verse 27, just a little farther down. One of the things that we've talked about in the book of Revelation is the Lamb's book of life. And this is what John writes, But nothing unclean will ever enter it. That is the new Jerusalem, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then look at Revelation 22, 5. And night will be no more. They will, no, they will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light. And they, that is us, will reign forever and ever. One of the incredible realities of heaven is that in heaven will be Christ's victorious church. One of the things and the themes that hopefully you've picked up over and over and over again that we've in- talked about nonstop, and the reason is because the book of Revelation talks about it nonstop, is the truth and the reality of overcoming or conquering. I don't know if you remember, just a few weeks ago, we were in Revelation 2 and 3, and at the end of all of those letters to the seven churches, there's to the one who conquers, to the one who overcomes, there's these promises. I want to remind you of those just for a little bit. In Revelation 2 through 3, to the one who overcomes, Jesus promises to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He promises them not to be hurt by the second death. To the third church, he promises to give some of them the hidden manna and a white stone with a new name. The fourth church, to give authority over the nations. The fifth promise, to be clothed in white garments and to never blot out their name. To the sixth church, that Jesus will make them a pillar in the temple of my God. And finally, that Jesus will grant them to sit with me on my throne. These are all promises, not just to anybody, but to the one who conquers, to the one who overcomes. All of these promises point directly to this reality of being in the presence of God. And experiencing unhindered access to our Creator. What does it mean to overcome? Over and over again in the book of Revelation, we've seen this reality that to overcome is to not compromise our faith. 
In the book of Revelation, compromise could mean literally choosing to live over death. Some of the people that were compromising their faith, they were compromising their faith because they knew if they said, I choose to only worship Jesus, what that meant for them is physical death. And what John is trying to remind these, listen, to overcome and to conquer might mean physical death, but in the end, it means something so much more. It means life eternal with God. And if you're willing to give up physical life here on earth, you might receive something greater in a, in a life with God forevermore. That's what, that's what it means to overcome. That's what it means to conquer. What's interesting, about, what's interesting about this word conquer or overcome in the book of Revelation is, is where it comes from. It's a Greek word. The Greek word is nikao. And that word also is used of a Greek goddess that you all might be familiar with. Nike. Is everybody familiar with Nike? Hopefully so. And there was this shoe company a few years ago that came up with these, this brilliant design to come up with sh some shoes and call them the brand Nike because of victory, right? Why, people buy these shoes for a reason, not, not just because they look cool, but also because they're for athletics, right? They're for athletes. People buy these shoes because they, they believe that when they buy these shoes, they're going to be able to perform better. Right? How many of you have ever done any sort of athletics or worked out in dress shoes? Number one, terrible idea. Don't do it. It's painful, okay? One time we were at the gym, and this guy who had never been there before came in in jean shorts. And I just wasn't 100% sure about that, but that's, that's true. And here's the reality. For us, if, if you're an athlete, you want to be able to have the appropriate footwear, right? You want to be able to put on the right shoes, and what John is telling the people in the book of Revelation is, listen, if you want to overcome, if you want to conquer, you're not going to be able to overcome and conquer in your own power. You're not going to be victorious in your own life. The only way you're going to be victorious is to put on someone. And that someone is Jesus. If you want to overcome in life, you could try all you want. You might die. You might live. But all of the realities that we've been talking about, this new heaven, this new earth, God's unhindered presence, you're not going to be able to bring about that in your own power. It's only in Christ, and when you put on Christ, that you're then going to be able to experience the new heaven, the new earth, God's unhindered presence in our own lives. And so much like these shoes, yes, they're, they're hopefully going to help me perform better. John, I'm praying they you know, take off seconds on my 40. I don't know if that's going to happen. They are lighter. They're going to hopefully help me do a little bit more in my performance and training. And just like, just like these shoes, you and I, we need... Jesus, and we have to put on Jesus. And listen, for those of, for those of you who are here and like, listen, I, I hear what you're saying. I understand Jesus. I recognize Jesus. I, I know all of those things. To put on Jesus is to have a relationship with Jesus. To recognize, listen, that the way, everything that we've been talking about, the way that God intended us to live and to be has been broken by our sin. And so to put on Jesus, the Bible talks about it as repentance and faith. To repent of our sin, to turn away from our faith, our, our, our sin, to recognize that we've done all of these things. And it's these sins that separate us from God. But in Christ, Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave free us from those sins. And, and when we place our faith and trust in Jesus we can have life in Christ. We can put on Jesus. And for some of you, you've never made that kind of decision before. It was a choice for me to put these shoes on. 
it's a choice for you to trust in Jesus. And so today, would you repent of your sins and believe in Jesus? Would you put on Jesus and experience what it means to be victorious? What it means to conquer? What it means to overcome? For those of us in Christ, listen, there is this reality that there's this initial decision, right? There's this initial point where for the first time in our lives, we repent and believe. But I want to challenge you that each and every day you wake up, it is a conscious decision for you to put on Christ. It is a conscious choice for you to wake up and say, I'm going to conquer through Jesus. But as we look at Revelation 21 and 22, I hope you see the incredible hope that we have, what God offers us through his son Jesus. And all that awaits between this moment and that moment is the return of Jesus. And as we close this morning, I want to just look at the second to last verse in the book of Revelation. In verse 21, John writes this, He who testifies to these things says, this is Jesus, Surely I am coming soon. And then John writes, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May that be our prayer, that Jesus would return, and that the hope of his coming would be the hope which we live the rest of our days with. That our prayer would be, come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for this morning. God, the incredible truth and reality, God, that there is going to come a day when you are going to make all things new. And God, we look forward to that day. We Uh, We patiently await your return because we know when you return, God, creation will be renewed. We'll experience your presence and together we will be victorious. And so this morning, Father, as we respond, God, together may we say, come Lord Jesus. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.